Welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living. This is a podcast where we talk to experts who have taken a wild idea and made it a reality. From sailing around the world to launching a thriving business or just standing up for what you believe in, some of the wildest ideas can lead to the most rewarding adventures. With your host, journalist Shelby Stanger. Welcome to episode two of Wild Ideas Worth Living. This episode is brought to you by Graced by Grit. The Women's Fitness Company was founded to help empower women cultivate their grit to find their grace. I love their name and I love their yoga and running pants. Not only do they make my booty look good, which is always important, but they offer classic styles and flattering fits made from the highest quality materials. They always look good on. Go to gracedbygrit.com and check them out. And when you enter the code WILDIDEAS, you'll get 20% off your first order. This episode was also brought to you by Surf Diva. The original all-women surf school has been teaching group, private, all-women, and co-ed lessons at their stunning San Diego location for over 20 years. I've taught surf lessons there for years and seen hundreds of men and women come through, learn to ride waves, and it literally changes their lives. Go to surfdiva.com or give them a call. And when you book a lesson in San Diego and mention this show or the code Wild Ideas, you'll get a $10 gift card to use towards your next lesson or in their store. Today's guest, Pete Koselnick, truly took a wild idea and made it a reality. He just finished running across the USA from San Francisco to New York. He ran for about 72 miles a day. It took him 42 days, 6 hours, and 30 minutes for a total of 3,067 miles. They've been calling him the real Forrest Gump, And he's just a financial analyst from Iowa who absolutely shattered a Guinness record. I love Pete's story because he has a full-time job and he managed to run four hours a day to do something incredibly wild. Without further ado, let's welcome Pete Kostelnik to the show. So Pete, welcome to the show. I'm really excited to have you on. Thanks for being here. Hey, thanks for having me, Shelby. Well, I have to just start with with why. I mean, why? And first of all, congratulations. This is just an incredible feat. Why did you decide to uh, do something so absolutely crazy, like run across the USA? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, you know, I, I think it's it's kind of in my DNA to do um, things that are a little outside the box. I've I've struggled doing some of the easiest tasks in life, and I've gone on to do other things that probably no one would ever want to do. Um, but I guess for me specifically, it was really a, a dream come true, um, really pairing together two of my biggest passions in life. Um, really, uh, ultra running, which has really become a big part of my life over the last five years. And then um, my whole life growing up, I've, I've always had a passion for the road. Um, in fact, I've actually driven to every state you can drive to, even Alaska, uh, when I was younger with my family. And um, so it was kind of a, a pairing of the two um, passions. And then also this record had stood since 1980. And um, I, I'm, I, I like the, the history behind it. And um, it's just one of those records that seemed like no one could would ever be able to break it. So I thought, hey, you know, why not go for it? 1980. I mean, so there had to be a reason that no one has really attempted to do this since 1980. That's a long time for a record to be standing. Um, I mean, you weren't even born in 1980. So why do you think that record stood so long? And um, there had to have been reasons. I mean, I mean, when you came up with this idea, there had to be, had to have been some stuff in your head saying, don't do it. Or I don't know what your wife thought or your friends thought or your family thought, but I'd love to just kind of hear from you why you stuck to this wild idea? Yeah, you know, I, I think one of the biggest reasons why no one has, has why this, the record has stood so long is um, just looking at ultra running. You see a lot of uh, runners who aren't necessarily that young. Um, so a lot of times, by the by the time a lot of runners get enough experience or uh, under their belt with ultra running, because it really is a, a sport where you have to know what you're doing and 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 have a lot of experience to to go for a record like this. And I think the main reason that I've noticed is it seems like by the time someone has enough um, of an ultra running resume to do a record, go for a record like this, they have kids and they have a career that um, really keeps them tied down. 
Uh, so, you know, I, I do have a, a regular job, but I have a great employer that was willing to let me take a leave of absence. But um, my li- wife and I don't have kids yet. So even though it was, I felt like it, I would like to have a couple more years to prepare for a run like this, um, I just knew that this was the one year I, I just had to go for it. So what do you what do you do on the side? You're a financial analyst? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, just just a eight to five desk job. Um <laughs> Uh, I work for a, a market research uh, company and based out of Nebraska. I love that you have a regular eight to five job and you just shattered a record. I think that's such a great story. Can you tell me about why running? Because you weren't always a runner, were you? No, no. I actually, you know, the the only real reason why I got into running. Um, so I did a couple of years in high school, then then took took off a few years in college. And really the only reason I got back into running in college at, at the very end of college was I'd probably put on about 25 to 30 pounds during college, just not, not, uh, not getting enough physical activity as I, I should have and, and getting kind of bogged down by, by school and, and work, um, on the side. And, and so, yeah, I tell people that, you know, I wouldn't really be, I would really the, the main reason for me even doing my first marathon was, um, just to get back in shape and, and, uh, a little bit better about myself. How interesting. So then why did you decide to all of a sudden go from being kind of a desk jockey to just an average above average runner to then running? I mean, how did you segue into ultra marathons and then running across the USA? I, I still don't understand. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so that, so just kind of getting me off the couch was, you know, just the inspiration to to be a little bit more fit and, and, uh, get away with eating and drinking about whatever I wanted. But then, um, you know, I met my wife in my last semester of college after I'd run my first marathon and she was a runner. And so, awesome. um, it, it actually it was kind of a, a long story short. She, I'd never met her, but I was subleasing from, um, another student, uh, just for the last semester. And she was actually one of the roommates. And so she would go running with one of the roommates and I was kind of jealous. And that, so I, I, uh, joined them and, um, she got me kind of back into running a little bit. And then, uh, I kind of, I, I, we had a little competition going cause she actually kicked my butt the first time out running. Um, <laughs> I got out of shape a bit. And, uh, so then, so yeah, I got back in shape and then, um, you know, I thought, Hey, I want to do another marathon. And, and so that was when I decided I wanted to try to qualify for Boston. Um, and, and so I did, um, later that fall and in 2009 and I did run Boston in 2010, but I, I, uh, was, dealing with a lot of nagging um, injuries and I was getting a little burnt out on marathon training. So in 2011, that's when I stepped up to ultra marathons as, you know, a way to kind of see running as a, something fun again. Um, I love really that you just said you're getting of... burnout. Sorry to interrupt you, but you said you were getting burnout on marathon yeah. running. So you go to ultra marathon running. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the funny thing about ultra marathons is that the community is you wouldn't, you go show up to an ultra marathon and you see a bunch of mostly just average looking people. Uh, you know, some of them actually don't even look like marathon runners and, and, uh, it, it's more, you know, I think ultimately, you know, there is some, some pretty cool competition with ultra marathons, but ultimately it's, it's just a bunch of people looking to have fun and, um, and really it's, it's more of an adventurous, um, I guess aspect or, um, adventurous, uh, persona to, ultra marathons, I think more so than marathons, because there's just so much flexibility to, to have them really anywhere on any terrain and any distance. So, um, it is amazing how many different types of ultra marathons, um, are out there today. It is cool. I really love the ultra community. I find runners to be such interesting people, especially the ones that go incredible distances. Um, I still don't understand though, what made you have this idea to, to kind of be the real Forrest Gump. Yeah, so um, that year uh, that I started getting into ultra marathons, I was in Colorado uh, to run the Pikes Peak Marathon, and uh, Marsha Ulrich was uh, was the um, keynote speaker at the at the expo, and he mentioned, well, so he had gone for the this same record that I I, did, I went for um, in 2008, about the exact same route in the same time of year, and I read his book uh, called Running on Empty. Um, which is, so he went for the record with Charlie Engel. And, uh, so I read that book a few times and I was just so inspired by his story about running through towns all the way across the country, meeting all sorts of people and, 
I think that was probably the tipping point as well, you know, just on top of it um, being a passion of mine, it was, it kind of made it real for me. And, and uh, I think, you know, it was something that I wanted to experience for myself as well. Yeah, I've, I really want to talk to you about the people you met on, along the way, because I've met some of the most incredible people on runs. But first, I really want to understand how much planning was involved before the actual run. Like when, what, when did Way you decide to do it? And then when did you go on the run? Yeah, I think, I think I, the tipping point for me to go for it was when I really pretty much immediately after I, I won Badwater, the Badwater 135 in Death Valley uh, last in July, 2015. Uh, and so it, that race is, it's billed as the world's toughest ultra marathon um, because it, it starts uh, 300 feet below sea level in Death Valley where temperatures get up to 130 degrees in this in that time of the year and um it finishes at the Whit- mount whitney portal and, and mount whitney is the highest mountain in the lower 48 and so after i won that race you know that was kind of my first big ultra marathon win on my resume and so that was when i i decided the next day i was talking to one of my one of my friends and said hey you know you know that run across America, I've always wanted to do, well, I think, you know, maybe I have the ability to go for the record. And that's where I started to plan out, you know, which year could I go for the record, maybe 2016, maybe 2017. And, you know, I, I think 2016 wasn't absolutely ideal, but that was when, you know, I, I, I just know that there's so many things in life that I haven't done and I, and then I ran out of time to do it. So I thought, well, Hey, you know, even if it's not the ideal year, I'm going to try to squeeze it into 2016, if, if at all possible. Good for you. And you had a team that helped you because it, my understanding is there was about a year of planning. Am, am I correct? Or Yeah, yeah, really. Um, you know, I, yeah, I started planning it really last fall um, by myself. And then I did a lot of um, – Charlie Engel was really, um, really a, a great mentor for me in planning this. Uh, he's a pretty well-known ultra marathoner, um, you, which you might know from like the, the documentary running the Sahara, uh, that he, he did. Um, but he, um, he, he almost seemed more excited about it than I was because you know, we would talk every couple of weeks. Yeah. And like, it was almost like he was, you know, wanting to move this along more than I was. And it was just amazing how uh, inspirational he was and how much help he was because, he really introduced me to Chuck and Dean who were two of the four people um, on my support crew. And, and uh, that was kind of what cemented my ability to to move forward with the plans was having Chuck, knowing Chuck and Dean would be with me the entire way. And then eventually um, Cinder, who is the massage therapist also came on board along with Tracy fan and, and Tracy and I did most of the planning together. And that was, you know, there's just so much more, you know, details that you don't realize going into a run like this to so tell us um, a little especially if you want to do it the right way yeah tell, tell me a little bit about the details besides yeah i mean it was i mean the route was a huge one which thankfully we also had the help of my sister uh ann um and i mean the route just in itself was just it, it was a work in progress really you know up until the second that you actually run on a certain part of the route because things change and you know we had flooding in Pennsylvania and, um, you know, routes can get bridges, get washed out. And so it's always a work and it's always, a, it's always moving. Um, and so that was just a huge part of it, you know, with working with local DOT to determine if roads are runnable, looking at Google images to see if the, the shoulders wide enough for me to run on and really everything like that. And then just, there was a lot of work to do with sponsors and, um, getting, just getting our our message out there as well and um everything like that and then um just planning ahead along with like nutrition and um everything like that as well so yeah it was just we also had events along the way uh to help promote the the run which i wasn't able to attend since um i was either running eating or sleeping <laughs> but uh but we had a lot of a lot of things like that as well to get people excited about the run which took a lot of planning as well so what did you do to train for this run? Uh, my training's really just been a, a gradual increase in mileage really ever since I, I uh, started doing ultra marathons about five years ago. Uh, it seems like every year I, I don't really have a plan in place until I get to 
the beginning of the year. Um, but really, it's just I always look back on my previous year, and I've always kind of just gone into school of thought. Well, if I want to get better at ultra running, I'll just run more miles <laughs> each week. And so every year, I've I've gradually increased my mileage, which I think has helped keep me away from injury by not increasing too fast. But um, this year, in a nutshell, I was doing 200 miles a week. Um, so basically doing 20 to 30 miles every weekday and then doing 30 to 50 mile, uh, extended runs on the weekend. And, um, it's definitely not something I've been able to get into overnight, but I have been lucky to not be injured at all. Um, so I think that was really, I mean, I, 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 I did do some cross training, um, in previous years, but actually, uh, this year I didn't do anything except run at all. (laughs) Wow. That's you're an anomaly. (laughs) Did you, did you do anything else (laughs) like stretch yoga? Did you go to a special massage therapist? Is your body had to break down 20 miles a day, 30 miles a day. That's 200 miles a week is a lot of miles. Yeah, it's funny. Um, you know, I, I had a great massage therapist for the run across the country, but I actually, yeah, I don't do, you know, it's, it's probably terrible to say, but I don't do any real stretching or anything. <laughs> Kids, don't listen to this guy. That Although, might have been, it's crazy, yeah, maybe, maybe it I worked. Would, yeah, don't do as I say. Um, but yeah, it, I think part of that, I mean, to do a run like this, you really have to be kind of unhealthy. And I think part of, maybe part of the, the success of the run was the fact that I, you know, just put myself through such hell in training that, um, my body was kind of kind of already used to it. You have to have incredible mental stamina. I'm pretty curious. How do you fit in 20 to 30 miles a day when you have a nine to five job or eight to five or whatever it is? Yeah, yeah. It's basically waking up at 5 a.m., getting out the door around 5:10, 5:15, uh, doing two hours, uh, roughly 15 miles at a that would be like an eight minute per mile pace. Um, and then, yeah, so then getting done and then going into work, uh, by 8 AM and then, um, getting home from work. I, so what I would usually do to make it as efficient as possible is I do my outside, do my outdoor run of about 15 miles in the morning. And then I would do an indoor treadmill run in the evening after work. And so then basically from about 5 30 PM until 7 30 PM, I was, running on a treadmill and, um, watching TV and my, my, uh, <laughs> the way I justify it is that I'd be just doing the same thing at home anyways. So if, if I'm watching TV with my legs moving, it's about the same thing. So, <laughs> so that would give me the four hours a day of, of running and that would give me 30 miles, um, on a weekday. Um, obviously my wife, you know, she doesn't want me to do that forever. And um, I was just going to ask you that. Grace, yeah. It's, I guess like the, the thing I got away with this year was she got a promotion at work, uh, to move to Hannibal, Missouri, which is actually where I just moved last week, um, after the run. So now I work from home, but she, uh, got a job down here, but she's actually been down here for about half the year already. So, uh, when I was banking some really high mileage weeks, even over 200 miles, we were, we had to live apart for a little bit. So that was kind of my excuse for, for doing so much training. <laughs> What was the typical day like um, on this route to run across America? From can you can you run us through a typical day from the time you woke up to the time you went to bed? Yeah, I mean it was it was almost it was sadly almost about the same as like when I you know the the one I just talked about with work except I re- replaced work with more running <laughs> and um, so I'd wake up at three thirty most days um, try to get out the door by four a.m. so. Um, about a half hour to get dressed, have breakfast, and then stretch out a little bit, which I actually did do stretching <laughs> um, during the run across the country. I knew you had to and, stretch. Yeah. And uh, so then from 4 a.m. until about 11 a.m., I would do a 40 mile run. Uh, right, so that would be when I would meet up with the RV again for lunch. And so I'd, I'd uh, so I, I would, Chuck and Dean, they were um, with me all day and they would leapfrog usually about every two miles with a, a car and they would provide me with, you know, anything I needed, food, drink or, or whatnot. So then, so we, I would get through 40 miles of running usually by about 11 AM. And that's when we would meet up with the RV again, wherever it was parked. And I would um, have lunch and then um, head back out usually 30 to 40 minutes later 
and uh, do around a 50K, so usually like 30 to 35 miles um, in the afternoon segment, usually starting around 11.30 in the morning, and then um, try to get done every day by about 5.30 p.m. It, it was nice, though, because towards the end of the day, sometimes if I if I was efficient with my lunch break and and I was running pretty good, then that would be kind of the peak miles where I can uh, just, I'm not in a big rush to get done for the day. So a lot of times around 3 p.m., I'd only have about eight miles to go and I would, I could walk most of those miles into the RV wherever it was parked for the night. And so that was always nice because it allowed me to kind of take in the scenery a little more and, and look around. Oh, um, that is nice. But yeah, once I got... Yeah, and then uh, and then once I got back to the RV, we would I would immediately shower and then have uh, sit down and have dinner, put my feet up, and I would usually have about half hour myself to just kind of hang out, um, talk to the crew and or friends that came out as well, and then uh, and then usually by around six thirty, um, I would um, get a massage for about fifteen to twenty minutes. Uh, from Cinder, the massage therapist, and then I'd be to bed around by around seven o'clock. Seven o'clock bed, and then back up at three a.m. the next morning. Yeah, so it was good because I mean a lot of people that do a run like this, they they're always sleep deprived, and um, you know I I would always um, pretty much except for a few nights, I would usually have an eight hour window to get enough sleep. Did you ever take a day off? Yeah, actually, I did. Um, the and I wasn't planning on it at all. Um, every day throughout the run, I was at um, 70 or more miles a day, um, except day seven, I took off completely um, because I had developed some really bad tendonitis in the fronts of my ankles from all the uphill in Yosemite National Park. And over the next couple of days after that day three in Yosemite, it, my um, tendonitis just kept getting worse and worse. And so I just had to take a day completely off and um, to help recover from that a little bit because uphills really isn't my strength. And thankfully that day that I took off the next few days weren't too, there weren't too many uphills. So, um, actually even while I was running 70 miles a day, the tendonitis kind of wore away. But I think looking back on it, I'm still really glad I took that day off because, um, you know, I, I went out a little too aggressively the first week and, and that cost me a little bit. Were there any other injuries you got on the way? Yeah, there's some um, minor aches and pains. Um, I had a tight hamstring for a while, especially in some of the colder weather up in the higher elevations in Utah and Colorado. And then uh, also I had my, my hips were usually pretty achy, uh, depending on the shoulder. Uh, a lot of times there's, the shoulder will um, kind of ramp downwards. Uh, while I was running into traffic on the left side of the road. And so just with all that, just even like a, a millimeter or a centimeter difference um, in in height of the shoulder between the left leg and the right leg would um, really get to me after a while. Um, and then I also had my, my knee, right knee would swell up uh, from time to time. Um, I think there was something rubbing, but thankfully um, my my stride, I didn't bend my knees too much the entire way across the country with my short stride. So, uh, I didn't really, didn't really need to have too much, um, flexibility. You sound like a really tough financial analyst. I have to say, um, <laughs> how, in, how did being a financial analyst help you? I, I read somewhere in an article about you that you are addicted to Excel spreadsheets and just love them. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I think uh, it really helps me um, plan out a run like this, and I'm always doing calculations. So I'm always, you know, I'm, I'm not an actuary, actuar, actuarious, or yeah, whatever. Uh, the people that um, that that do the 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 risk benefit of insurance. So, but I feel like I'd be a really good one because, like, taking like that day off, you know, I knew okay, what's the benefit of losing 70 miles today by not running and. So yeah, I was doing. I was always doing a lot of calculations, and it was kind of funny because I would my my uh, support team was probably just like perplexed at my ability to always find a way to finish the day like right at five thirty because because I was always doing calculations even going into lunch break like okay I got thirty seven miles to go today and I got this amount of time to do it and this is the pace I'm going to have to average to do that and uh, so that that was 
you know, kind of a nerdy way to, to get through the day, I guess, as well. So then what did you think about the whole time? When, what do you think about when you're running? Sadly, the calculations take up most of my brain power. But, um, you know, I, I would think about, you know, what I have in front of me, you know, like if I was in Nebraska, um, I would think about, oh, well, uh, you know, I was coming up and that's where I'm from. And I'm going to see all my family and some relatives and a lot of old friends. And so I think just looking forward to, you know, what's up the road and, and, um, and whatnot, but it was really mentally challenging, especially towards the end of the run. Um, whenever I, whenever I was running alone, because yeah, you just kind of get to a point where you're like, okay, I've, I've done this same song and dance 39 times already. And I still have to do it four or five more times. So what do you (laughs) say to yourself in those situations where you probably don't want to keep running? Uh, you know, I, I think it's just knowing that the sooner you get it done, the sooner you can enjoy it again. (laughs) And I think it was really thinking about that end of the day where I can start to walk a little bit. And that was, you know, where I had days where I didn't have much time to walk at the end of the day to get, get done by five 30. I was always a little upset. So I think just knowing that that positive reinforcement of knowing, okay, you know, if I, I know that, you know, days that I really focus and get the miles done, you know, I've had really good days where at the end I can just really relax a bit. And I think that was what helped get me through most days. Um, aside from people that came out to run with me and really, uh, get my mind off the mind numbing part of the run. Did you meet any interesting people on the way? Oh yeah. You know, lots of people. Um, you know, I was a little sad that Tom Hanks didn't come out to run with me the last day because I, <laughs> oh, I put, that we, been great. did a big social media push to get that to happen. But no, I mean, it was, you know, that's the, I think the biggest takeaway I got from the run was the people I met, um, you know, from, you know, someone, you know, from, uh, you know, 12 year old boy that came out, you know, with his parents and ran, you know, a couple of miles with me to, on the second to last day, the race director of the Boston Marathon came out and ran with me. So it was just just incredible the 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 how fun that was to to meet all sorts of people. Um, and yeah, just so many new friends and and you know, and I th- I think the thing I like the most about it is so many new friends, but they're just so geolog- ge- geographically diverse that now whenever I go through Utah, I know that oh Kim is there, and uh, when I go to uh, Ohio, I know that, uh, Brooks is there. And so it's just really cool now that, um, whenever, you know, I'm thinking about driving somewhere, or traveling somewhere, or just watching the news and like, Oh, I know someone that lives there. It's, it's a lot of fun to just remember and, and think back on all the people I met along the way. It sounds fantastic. Do you have any memorable moments that really stand out that you'll just never forget? You know, on a run like this, a lot of the big things that happen are bad. Like, you know, one, one of our cars got rear-ended and totaled. And, um, but thankfully, you know, nothing nothing too crazy like that happened um, be, besides that. You know, I would say the mo- more, like, emotional moments, like where I was running by myself that, um, you know, I think back on. I, I think back on, you know, the day before I took a day off and going down a hill and, and really crying because I, I was – I couldn't even hold like a 10 minute mile pace going downhill um, with how bad the tendonitis was, how bad that pain was. So that's one that really sticks out to me, but then there's a lot of good ones. Um, I just remember like walking up a mountain pass at the sunrise in Colorado and um, crossing the Mississippi river at five in the morning or six in the morning in the dark um, crossing that. And then of course, crossing the, George Washington Bridge coming into New York City um, and just looking over to my right. There was actually a really good video of it. I was just, I look over to my right and I see the city for the first time. And I think that was probably the most emotional part of the run was seeing New York City and and just thinking about New York City so much over 40 some days and then it's right there in front of you. That's incredible. What are some of the best things people said to you on the way? I was thinking about, you know, no one had ever the entire run, I don't think any like person driving by said anything mean to me. Um, and so that was, and it was incredible because we met so many people that had no idea what ultra marathons were or anything like that. And they were just very excited for me. And, um, 
yeah, just a lot of great things, I think. Um, and, you know, I think my favorite is just the people that said, wow, you know, you, you're, you're really a mentally strong person because, you know, I'm not necessarily like a gifted athlete. Uh, I never have been and probably never will be super gifted um, at anything athletic. So um, I think, I think that was what meant to me that that was the thing that meant the most to me was people that talk about my mental uh, fortitude and, and that I've more so than, Oh, wow. You're just like a freak athlete because it's uh, uh, really not true. I mean, you have to be really gifted though. <laughs> mentally. It's, it's just incredible what you've done and, and you talk about yourself so nonchalantly and, and humbly. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. I'm, I'm digging this story. Everybody's been asking me to ask you, what did you eat? I read that you ate every oh. 20 minutes about 13,000 calories every day. And I just cannot imagine how you get 13,000 calories a day. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I, I mean, I pretty much ate just about anything you can. I mean, anything that gives you energy, I guess. Um, I guess the one, of the, a few of the, the highlights, though, are I would eat a lot of red meat because I've um, – I, I have dealt with some low iron um, issues and um, uh, some anemia as well, which can come, which can, which is pretty common. People that run a lot of miles um, deal with, uh, but um, a so lot you're of, not a vegan. No, <laughs> I'm, just kidding, I'm just kidding. Nope, nope, not at all. You know, it's funny. Yeah, it's funny because you know I'm there for a while. Uh, my wife, she's a vegetarian, and and I was kind of in that same vein just by default, but. Um, but yeah, that, that's been one thing I think that's really helped. And, um, I eat a lot of power or I eat a lot of protein bars every day. Um, that was the thing I like about them is that they have a lot, obviously a lot of protein, but, um, a lot of good energy. So, uh, I could kind of go both ways with it. Um, a lot of trail mix, uh, a lot of soda, a lot of, uh, Gatorade, um, and of course, at the end of each day, I think about 10% of those calories, 13,000 calories was just eating a bunch of ice cream. Uh, I'd usually eat a pint of ice cream <laughs> at the end of each day. And, uh, I mean, some of them are probably like 2000 calories in themselves, but, wow. um, yeah, I mean, just, just really always eating. And then like, even when I went to bed, um, I, I tend to wake up every couple hours anyways, um, at the night during the night. And, uh, we we would always put three or four protein bars next to my bed um, every night because I would literally wake up hungry in the middle of the night and have to eat. So uh, I probably didn't go the entire run without eating something at least every three hours. Um, and then while I'm running, I'm probably eating something. Uh, there was probably never an hour while I was running that I didn't have something of with any calories in it. I always found it really interesting that ultra runners – drink so much soda. Can, can you explain why that is? Yeah, it's, it's soda is so weird because I think there's so many different reasons. Um, like, you know, in the morning I would even often drink diet, uh, Coke. Um, and people are like, well, why you don't you want the calories? Like, well, yeah, but I don't necessarily want too much sugar in the morning, but, um, really in the morning I would do it for the caffeine. And then there were times where, um, I don't know if it's just a placebo effect, but it just felt like when I had a soda with something I was eating, um, my stomach, it, it went through my stomach a lot faster. So I didn't have a heavy stomach. Um, and then, and then also towards the end of the day, when I need a sugar boost to get to the finish line, a lot of times I would drink, uh, something like a Mountain Dew with higher sugar, just to give me a little extra boost. Um, to get to get through it. So on this show, I talk all about eating vegan and eating healthy, and you're completely just crushing everything I talk about. But it but it's okay oh, because yeah, you just yeah. you just broke yep. a record and um, defied a lot of rules. So it's just so funny. <laughs> yeah, I, I compare it. Yeah, I mean, it really is like you know the guy that eats the most, like the the food eating contest. I mean, it really is like maybe I'm not eating as much food as that during the run, but I mean, it's definitely not a healthy. Um, venture to do although you know a lot of ultra running is is probably a lot more healthy and and uh food conscious if you had to do this all over again is there anything you would do differently um you know i think if if i were to do it again i mean hindsight's 2020 20, but if, if i were to actually go out and do this again knowing what i did 
in the uh, first attempt, I would definitely not go out so aggressively the first week where I did a couple 80 mile days. But I think that was actually a really good learning experience um, for me because, you know, you, it taught me a lesson to, to not push it too hard early on. Um, but, you know, other than that, I think, you know, I, 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 I'm, I kind of wish I uh, document did more vo- like voice memos on my phone. Uh, that was one thing I wanted to do towards the end of each day was kind of document my thoughts and it just didn't work out that way because I just wasn't in the, the mood to do it. So I think maybe just documenting my thoughts a little more. Um, I did do a quick like one liner each day um, in a journal, but it was just like a few words. So uh, I think I'm definitely going to have to start documenting my thoughts a lot more um, from this run. If I want to not forget a lot of the, the big memories. Yeah. No, that, I mean, it would have been fantastic to know what was going through your head at each uh, at each stop, but I'm sure you were just so tired. What, yeah. <laughs> did you ever think about doing this with someone else, or did you always want to do it alone? Yeah, um, you know, actually, that's a good question. Uh, no one's really asked me that. Um, I was actually planning. Um, you know, I won't I won't name his name, but um, <laughs> I was actually under the at bus. one time. <laughs> Because he, yeah, he had a lot of things that came up this year um, with him. Uh, you know, just just things in life. You know, that I was kind of worried about for myself. You know, when will I ever be able to do this? Um, so, you know, good things like uh, you know getting a new job or you know getting engaged. And um, but yeah, actually, I was uh, planning on uh, there for a while to do it uh, with another runner. Um, and so it would be a dual um, a dual attempt to go for the record. So. You might see his name come across some year uh, trying to break my record now. <laughs> <laughs> do you think you're going to do this again? Oh, uh, no, I I really don't think. I, if I did, it would be, gosh, I, I can't really think of an excuse of why I could do it again. Um, you know, even if someone were to go out and break the record, you know, next year, I I think, you know, I just have to tip my hat to them and, and you know, just look at it as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. It sure sounds like a once in a lifetime opportunity. It's just an incredible feat. Um, I- I'm curious to know what what were you like as a kid? Um, you know, I was really quiet um, and really shy, uh, and I still kind of am sometimes uh, when I meet new people. But um, yeah, very quiet kid. Um, I think maybe a little. It took me a while to kind of develop mentally. <laughs> I was. Yeah, just just a very kind of calm and quiet kid, and I think just really, you know, the shyest person in the room most of the time. Who were your biggest influences as a kid? Ooh, um, gosh, I mean, I kind of grew up idolizing. I, I was a big baseball fan growing up, and that was kind of my life for a while. And so I would have to say... Uh, Frank Thomas was my favorite baseball player. I looked up to him and uh, let's see, as far as like music, um, I was in love with Shania Twain for some odd reason, even though I didn't really like uh, country music. (laughs) Well, didn't you say you were living in Iowa or Nebraska, middle of the country? Yeah. Yeah. I I grew up in Iowa and and I've kind of been all around the Midwest. I lived in Kansas City for a while. Nebraska now back down in Missouri culture over on the near uh, St. Louis. If you could go back in time and tell your 15 year old self one thing, what would you tell him? Uh, you know, I think I always struggled taking a first step and, and that's kind of been my motto for this whole run. Uh, we had some really cool little laminated cards that had a, my little quote that says, um, you know, the first step is always the hardest. So take it and never look back. And that's kind of, that was kind of my mantra every morning getting out of the RV was, I was always the worst time of the day. I was always in a bad mood and I was always thinking, okay, take that first step, get that first mile out of the way as quickly as you can. So you don't have to think about it ever again and really just kind of rip rip the bandaid off. Um, But looking back to me when I was 15, um, you know, that was one thing I didn't start doing cross country until my junior year of high school. And that, I think it was a confidence problem, but it was also just kind of like a first step problem. Um, and so I think, you know, I definitely tell my 15 year old self, you know, don't wait until you're 17 to do cross country or, you know, don't wait, keep waiting to do these things. Cause you know, you, 
if you would have done them earlier, maybe you would have, you know, just had more time to do it and just more time to have fun and, and, uh, enjoy what you're doing. It's interesting. I have a guest who was just on the show and she also broke a Guinness record. She didn't have Guinness there. So it wasn't, it wasn't, it, she's not going to be next to the guy with the longest fingernails, which was her childhood dream. She was born in 1880, but, <laughs> but she says the same thing. She says that starting lines for her have always been more important than finish lines, which I think is so interesting. Oh yeah. Without a doubt. But how did it feel to cross that finish line? Oh, it was incredible. Uh, you know, it was very emotional for me um, because um, my wife, actually, I hadn't seen her the entire run. Um, so I got, I hadn't seen her in all like almost two months. And so she was actually standing there by design uh, waiting for me at the very end. Aww. And so that was really overwhelming. And and the guy with the record was standing there too, uh, Frank Janino. Um, so and I cool. had never met him either and or i never met him before period and so he was there and you know it was everything i expected it to be and more um with just seeing my wife and and having frank being such an inspirational guy and very humble and then also a lot of my other friends and family that surprised me um in new york city as well so yeah it was it was, it was just incredible your wife must be a pretty big badass as well i'm guessing Oh yeah, without a doubt. Uh, she's uh, she's a very good runner. Um, so we go running a lot together, and um, yeah, she's she's amazing. There's a lot of people who just don't run but want to get into it. What advice can you give to people who just are fearful of getting into running or want to try to run a marathon or a 5K or an ultra? They just want to get into it, either from a small level or a grand level. What advice can you give them? Uh, you know, go out and, and, and enjoy it. Um, and, and by enjoy it, I mean, don't like go out and run and, and start like run as hard as you can for two miles or don't treat each run because don't treat each run like a, a race because, you know, that's how people get injured. And that's how I've lost a lot of, of my running colleagues to injury is, um, you know, they, they go out and they go too hard too early and try ramping up mileage too quickly. Um, and one thing I've learned in ultra marathons is a lot of times, even the best ultra marathoners on certain courses have to walk at some point. And so a lot of times when I go out for a run, you know, I'll, I'll run for a certain amount of times and I'll walk a lot. And, um, I think just going out by feel, um, if, if you can only run a quarter mile without walking, then just jog, you know, a quarter mile and then walk and, and jog, and then you'll get in really good shape really quickly. Um, if you just, go out there and, and have fun and, and, you know, push yourself, but don't uh, push yourself too hard all at once or overnight and, and uh, really look, look at it holistically. Uh, and I think that's, that's the biggest um, advice that I give anyone. I, I like your advice of walking as well. I've competed in college and high school. I started competing again recently in road races and, and I have a hard time walking, but then I get injured. So there you go. I'm going to start walking. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's well, walking's great. <laughs> if you could fly a plane and we'll, we'll make this an eco-friendly plane over the sky and it could read one message to the world, what would it say? Oh gosh, maybe just that quote that I was, that I had mentioned, like, you know, the first step is always the hardest, you know, to take it and, and, uh, and never look back or, you know, maybe something tailored more to a wider audience, but you know, if, if there's something that, or, you know, there's no, there's no reason why if someone can do something that you can't do it too. I mean, there are, you know, certain Olympic athletes that none of us will ever, ever reach that threshold, but there's so many things in life, I think that are so much within our control that, um, we can all accomplish that we just, you know, it might, might take us a little bit more work than someone else, but, um, there's no reason why, you know, that can't be, can't be us. I love that. What's the best gift you've ever received? Probably like my first bicycle, I think. Cause that was, you know, that was something you're always excited about as a kid. And, and it, it is amazing. Like, I mean, that's really your first kind of venture into physical activity is your, your first bicycle. So I'd, I'd have to say that. Are there any books you love or recommend? Yeah, I, I really, I really love, uh, Running on Empty by uh, Marshall Ulrich, um, and then Charlie Engel just came out with his Running Man uh, book. 
Um, so th- those are both just really great reads. Um, and um, I th- I, Born to Run is also a really fascinating book uh, from a running perspective as well that I I love to read. I was going to ask you about that. So I've been running with Chris McDougall. He's a great guy. And um, we went running barefoot. I traded him barefoot running lessons for – no, he traded me barefoot running lessons and I took him surfing and then – dump my camera in the ocean, but you know, he's, he's a minimalist and you wear, you wear the Hoka's. Can you talk to me briefly about, so you wear these shoes, um, for the audience, Hoka, Hoka one, is that what you call them? Yeah. Hoka one, one, uh, I wear the, the Clifton three model. Um, so yeah, they're actually, I mean, it's funny that there's been such, you know, people are like, Oh, well, what are you, what, which is it? Are we supposed to be minimalist or are we supposed to go with extra cushion like the Hoka's? And um, my response is always, you know, I think we're all meant to run as if we were running barefoot because, um, you know, I see a lot of runners that, that put on these, uh, shoes with more cushion and then they start pounding their legs and they, Oh yeah, I'm, you know, my legs feel great. But I think there's a lot of damage that can be done if you aren't, you know, cognizant of your, your cadence and your, and your, the way you're planning your foot. So, um, so I always say that, you know, I, th- I think it, for me, it helps to have extra cushion um, on the Hoka's uh, for racing and, and training, especially in having my legs feeling fresh. But um, I think there is a lot that can be learned from um, that that book about, you know, how we're supposed to run and, and how we're not supposed to run. I love that book. Um, and those shoes do look really cool, I have to say. So I'm curious to try them. If you had to pick Yeah, they it- make you taller, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bonus. How tall are you, by the way? Oh um, my! Like five ten. So with those shoes, you're six foot. Yep. Awesome. If you had to pick one song that played in the background of the movie in your life, what would that song be? Oh, see, this is what I always, I always geek out on when I'm running too, because like, oh, that's totally my song. <laughs> um, you know, I, I would have to say there's two Tom Petty songs, uh, "Running Down a Dream," and then for this this run, I always. I kind of get emotional when I hear learning to fly, um, by Tom Petty. So I would say those, those two songs are kind of like Pete songs all the way. I know so many runners who listen to those songs, including myself. Those are great <laughs> songs. Did you have an iPod that you were listening to at all times or did you listen no, to music? Actually, I never, I, I listen to music a lot while I run like training, but, uh, I never, ever listen to music during this run. Wow. Is that for safety reasons or? Was there yeah, reason? mostly safety reasons, and then I just didn't feel like carrying anything either with me. Good for you. So what did you do after you finished the run? Uh, so the, immediately afterwards went to, uh, like I promised, I went and got a beer with my friends and family and uh, had dinner. And and then the next day was really just like straight up, like from one one network to another doing interviews. And so it was a little overwhelming, but, uh, actually I, I went home, you know, just a couple of days after in New York city and then, uh, just kind of kicked back and relaxed. And it was, it was pretty nice. Is there, is there a book maybe in the works? Oh gosh. I, I don't know if anyone in their twenties can be trusted to write a book, but <laughs> I, I think I'll definitely 30. document it. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think I'll definitely document this run as if I was writing a book, and then maybe someday. But uh, don't don't uh, don't hold your breath on that one. I have a feeling some publishers are going to call you. So, what are you going to do now? Like, do you have any plans? Are you and your wife going to just chill? Are you still running? Are you taking a break? Yeah, um, I'm getting back into running. I'm I'm I took a, about a week off, and then I kind of just gradually kind of been easing back into you know three to seven mile runs, just real, real slow pace. Um, but yeah, I have a lot of plans, uh, for racing, especially in 2017. I don't know if I'll do any of these like adventure, um, fastest known time runs, like for a record. Um, but I, I do have a, I do have a desire to get back into racing. Um, I think the, the 24 hour, uh, ultra marathon is the most intriguing one to me right now. Uh, basically you, you run as many miles usually on a loop course as you can in a 24 hour, uh, period. So I'm actually going to hopefully, um, be on the team USA that, um, goes to the world championships this next July, uh, in Northern Ireland and, and compete there and, 
I try to do as good as I can. That's awesome. So where can listeners find out more? More about you, more about your run and what you're up to. Yeah. Yeah, there's uh there's a website, uh Pete's Feet AA.com and then there's Pete's Feet Across America and, and this is Feet spelled F E E T. Um so there's a, yeah, a Facebook page, Pete's Feet Across America. Um, I'm on Twitter and Instagram, just Pete Kostelnik. And um, yeah, the, uh, there's a lot of good um, articles out there. Like New York Times had a really good article about the run. I saw and that. And ultra running in, in general. That's yeah, a great and story. yeah, they're r- really good. Yeah, uh, even brought in some Olympic athletes and got their, you know, just more of a general ultra running article. So that just came out recently. So, so yeah. Cool. Well, Pete, thank you so much for being on the show. Audience, if you're listening, Tom Hanks, you owe Pete a call. I think that would be appropriate. <laughs> and um, check out Pete'sFeetAA.com. You can also check out his Facebook page at Pete's Feet AA on Instagram and Facebook. Pete, thank you so much for being on the show and congratulations. You are a stud and such an inspiration. I really appreciate having you on the show. Oh, thank you so much. I loved it. I loved it. loved your questions. And yeah, it was great. Great, uh, great hour. Awesome. Well, I'll talk to you soon. Thanks again, Pete. Take care. Ha- bye. Thanks for listening to episode two of Wild Ideas Worth Living. What an incredible story Pete Kostelnik has. The fact that he managed to train for four hours a day while working a full-time job is pretty remarkable. I have no excuses. Our next guest is Cindy Whitehead, so stay tuned for next week. She's an incredible woman. Cindy started a movement called Girl is Not a Four-Letter Word, and she's one of the first female skateboarders that really made a mark on the sport. She paved the path for many women after her, and in her later years, she somehow managed to skateboard down the 405 freeway, one of the busiest freeways in the world, and she'll also share with us how she got Joan Jett to introduce her at a really major event. So check it out next week. And while you're at it, sign up for the newsletter on wildideasworthliving.com. Thanks so much. And wherever you are in the world, remember some of the best adventures happen when you follow your wildest ideas.